some women's lust for money costs others dearly. I wanted to break his arms. A nurse saves her bank balance, not a life. She gets the house, she gets insurance money. Do you want your $800 or not? A sister calls in a family debt. She took sibling rivalry to an entirely new level. Willing. Pay me by the deadline. Are you going to jail? And an embezzler cooks up more than the books. The oldest motive on the books. Old-fashioned greed. These deadly women reap rewards they don't deserve. They have a hunger for cash. Good morning. How are you today? I'm not too bad. You go with the dragon lady. 1983, Los Angeles, California. Morning, Mr. Spas. How far are you today? 35 year old Maureen McDermott. I just need to get your blood pressure. Nurse Mickey to her patients has a reputation for caring. She was a lovely person. She enjoyed life. She was quite the, the charmer also. And she isn't just watching over the sick. There's 34-year-old colleague, Jimmy Luna. A lost soul with a short fuse. Jimmy! What did I tell you? Did you hear what he said to me? I don't care what he said to you. Jimmy Luna survived a terrible childhood. Did you just go back to work? He was given up. When he was only six months old. I care about you keeping this job. The family that took him in really didn't want to raise him either. She was probably a mother figure to him. And he would do whatever she asked him to do. Mickey has an after hours reputation too. She runs with the rich and beautiful of the Van Nuys gay scene. She started palling around with some female friends that had a lot of money. She'd go out with them, party with them, slowly getting herself in debt, trying to keep up with the Joneses. Mickey was making good money as a nurse, but one job wasn't enough to support the lifestyle she wanted. Mickey knows about a second job that could help clear her debts. Trouble is, someone else has it. Fellow nurse, ideal earner for Mickey. How'd you like to get even with Dwayne? What do you mean? I wanted to break his arms. Well, I don't think that people really understand how really cunning that some people can be. I need his night job. And Mickey was one of those people. This is his address. Mickey's idea on how to get Dwayne's position was not to become a better nurse. Her idea was to have Dwayne's arm broken so he couldn't provide care. So you'll do it? Yeah. Yeah, I'll do it. I need you to make sure he can't come into work. The next day, a bright and breezy Mickey arrives at work thinking her future is secured. Until... Morning, morning. Hi. What happened to you? Uh, these three guys started busting last night. Bro. I don't think they'll be around in a hurry. Dwayne Bell was a big guy, and there was uh, that was going to happen. Hey, you have a nice day. Me too. Nikki's now desperate for money to sustain her party lifestyle. And thinks new acquaintance, 27-year-old Stephen Eldridge, might be the answer. He connected with Mickey because they had similar backgrounds in terms of they were both gay. He was a gay male, she was a gay female. I'm, I'm moving in. Amazing! Amazing. <laughs> they became friends and got a place together. Soon after Stephen moves in... Did you decide anything? Okay. Mickey makes him an offer to co-invest in her house. As a handyman and landscaper, Stephen jumps at it. 
She told my brother that she owned the house and, you know, that she was taking this nursing job that was going to take her abroad and that she needed someone to help fix it up. And they would eventually sell it so he could make a profit. It was an older Spanish style of home, so it had a lot of character, a lot of architectural detail that, you know, you can you know, really highlight. So he was very excited about it. Stephen gives her $10,000. And to protect their interests, they both take out life insurance policies. All done. They had insurance on it, so if anything happened to Mickey or anything happened to Stephen, the other would inherit the, the property. You. There's just one actually own the house. Mickey didn't put Stephen's $10,000 towards the house. She just told him that she had. but it is soon clear that they are not the ideal housemates. Twenty box stuff, I'll do it later. Yeah, I've heard that before. It's fine, I'll do it later. He was a very neat and very organized person, and she was not the neatest person. Just months after moving in, Stephen wants out. You okay? I want to sell my house. What? Yeah. Are you serious? I need the money out. Get out. But Mickey seems strangely reluctant. She's dragging her feet on things and not wanting to do things and not wanting to, you know, go forward. Stephen eventually wanted to get his money and get out. This was a big problem for Mickey. She had to come up with a solution. The solution was not going to be favorable to Stephen. California, 1985. The Van Nuys home of Mickey McDermott and Stephen Eldridge is about to go on the market. When 27-year-old Stephen is the victim of a brutal home invasion. Shut up and we'll cut you. They basically stripped him down into his, his skivvies. He was tackled. He was put on the bed and he was tied. Stephen has no idea who is attacking him or why. He only knows he has to run. Somehow he broke free and in the night ran out the back door, stark naked and running down the street yelling, help me, help me. Housemate Nurse Mickey offers the comfort for which she's renowned. <laughs> Okay, how are you feeling? Not great. And writes off the experience as a sad fact of life. They thought it was typical gay bashing. Someone had followed him from the bar and just gay bashed him. And back in the 80s, that was okay to do. I gotta go to work, all right? All right. But it's not a gay bashing. It's all Mickey's work. Steve, out of the way, she gets insurance money. She gets everything that she wants and doesn't have to deal with Stephen. Her thug, Jimmy Luna, has again failed to deliver for Mickey. She sends him back. But this time, on April 25th, 1985. He's not home yet. Mickey will play a part too. First, she must look like a victim. As Jimmy slice her chest. She wanted to kind of organize and orchestrate how it was going to work. Go wait downstairs. She was drawing a picture the whole time. She was the Picasso of the murder. I mean, she was the artist. Then, Mickey indulges in some self-harm. To make it look like she had been battered, she slammed her head down on a desk, causing a significant hematoma. Hematomas can kill people unfortunately that didn't happen in this case Stephen was coming home from a dinner party that evening and as he was coming in the door the two Lee brothers and Jimmy Luna were already in the house and jumped on this time Stephen is outnumbered and overwhelmed Jimmy Luna proceeded to stab him multiple times
stuff. But Mickey's not finished. Don't, don't forget to cut off his penis. Okay. She gives directions to Jimmy to go ahead and sever the penis. She wanted him mutilated so that it looked like a homosexual murder. Next, Mickey calls 911 and does what she does best. Pretends. Her story was that she was home taking a bath and these three men, you know, broke into the house and drug her into the bedroom and cut her up and beat her up and then brutally murdered my brother. Mickey thought she was so smart that she could pull off a murder and fool the entire LAPD homicide unit. But she left out one important thing. The temperature of the water in the bath gave her away. It was inconsistent with what she had told the cops. Mickey claims the attack occurred three hours earlier. It was obviously much warmer than it should have been. So she had drawn the bath before she called the, the paramedics. Mickey is making all the wrong moves. Did you take a polygraph? And she said, I'll talk to my attorney. Mickey's response should have been, whatever you want, detective, I will do. You know, just make sure you find the person that did this to my roommate, you know. That would have been what I would feel was a normal response. The third strike comes from the Lee brothers. In return for immunity, they give evidence against Mickey and Jimmy. Jimmy Luna pleads guilty to murder and receives life without parole. It's like she used Jimmy Luna as a stick or a knife and Marvin and Don Dell as a, as a sword and a hatchet. Those, those were her weapons, people. In June 1990, Maureen Mickey McDermott is found guilty of first degree murder and attempted murder. As mastermind, she's sentenced to death and remains on death row. Mickey's criminal behavior is classic psychopath. She's not afraid to do anything. Murder, mutilation, assault, battery, lying, stealing. That's the mark of a psychopath. Nurse Mickey had the world fooled that she cared for people. In truth, she didn't mind who she hurt. This is a case of a really good guy getting something he didn't deserve. Stephen was always the, the joy of the room. So there was a lot of people that loved him. Now the world knows the real Nurse Mickey. And life doesn't go as planned. You don't care about them or me. Marie felt that uh, Willie took advantage of her, used her. You can always count on family. I can get a gun. Shooting him, drowning him, throwing him off a cliff to die for you. What brother would think that the family member would do that? <laughs> the Great Depression means life in the 1930s is a struggle for many. During depression, you could probably get someone killed at their throat cut for 25 cents. So times were hard. But Illinois mother of four, 35-year-old Marie Porter, is luckier than most. Wait for dinner. I'm so hungry. At least she can feed her family. But almost idyllic. They take vacations every year. They own an automobile. Graham's coming on and he's acting real strange. Come on! Come on! But they have one problem. Hi, Dad. Marie's father, George. What are you doing? None of your business. He's emotionally unstable and getting worse. George had a revolver that he had used in his last job as a night watchman. Dad, do you want to get rid of him? Don't pet me. I'm not your dog. They felt George 
was a danger to themselves to herself. I know your plan to get rid of me. Now that's crazy talk. They frankly thought he was nuts. And feared that he might use it. Armed and delusional, George finally cracks in 1935. George Kappen came downstairs and William said, good morning. And what he got was shot in the back. Then George turns the gun on his own daughter. She tried to get the gun away from her father. Couldn't. She got a flesh wound in her arm. Ran out of the house. Her husband put his arms around her and said, I think I'm finished. And he, of course, did die. It had to be terribly traumatic when Marie's elderly father shot and killed her husband and shot her three times. There is no telling how that might have affected her. George is committed to an asylum, leaving Marie to raise her children alone. But she has some good fortune. She was awarded $5,000 life insurance. Now, that was a lot of money in the 30s. To convert that to modern day terms, that was probably something like about $85,000. It's a lot of money. Marie can even afford to take in her unemployed brother, 36-year-old William Kappen. She took him in because uh, he was down and out. Ralph, I'll try. Marie uses the money to go into business, a candy store, hiring family friend, 21-year-old Ralph Gianola. But Marie soon finds out that during the Great Depression, fancy candy is a luxury most people can't afford. Hi, how can I help you? Just a dime's worth of mints, please. Oh, 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 we have some beautiful chocolate. Oh, no, thank you. Just a dime, thank you. By spring of 37, she has really hit bottom financially. Marie's almost in the gutter. But life for her brother, William, has never been better. I'm getting married. He's even planning to marry. Is everything okay? Willie, I'm struggling. I can really use some help. He had asked her brother for some money because she felt like she was going broke. And she did have four children to support. William couldn't give it to her. Who wouldn't? What would you have me do? Cancel my own wedding? When she was in danger of losing her candy store and the house, I think she became resentful. Don't you care about your nieces? You, you don't even care about them? Of course I care about my nieces. How can you even make it about that? Marie took sibling rivalry to an entirely new level. Thanks a lot, Marie. If William won't give Marie any money, she knows another way. William had $3,300 in insurance policies and marie was a beneficiary it probably seemed to be the quickest and easiest way to get her hands on the money she needed there's just one problem william will soon have a wife and the day he got married that life insurance was signed over to his wife to be the beneficiary this caused marie to hatch a plan it's time for young Ralph to win Employee of the Month. There's no more time to be wasted. Wow. Isn't it beautiful? 1937. On the eve of their wedding, 38-year-old William Kappen and his fiancée prepare for their big day in St. Louis, Illinois. You've got to be back here in eight hours. They were making last minute plans for their wedding the next day. Good luck in sleep at all. Like any young couple, I suppose, feeling ready to win. I'm very happy. Big moment in their life. But as William plans the rest of his life, his sister Marie is plotting to end it. Marie convinces her young and gullible employee, Ralph, to help. I can get a gun. 
Marie was able to actually sit down with Ralph and discuss various ways to kill William. Or wood alcohol. Shooting at Marie. They have to decide quickly. They just have to get it done before the wedding. She offered Ralph $800 of the insurance money and kill him now. With just hours to go, Marie entices William out for a pre-wedding drink. Oh, come on. I don't want any more whiskey. With Ralph and his younger brother, John Giancola. Where the hell are we going? Can we please just go home? I'm going to get married in the morning. He said, I'm supposed to marry at 10 o'clock. You know, it's just several hours until then. They don't drive to a bar. I drive a couple of miles out of East St. Louis. One more bar. I don't want to go to any more bars. Will you take me home, please? When Marie pulls out the automatic that she had gotten from Ralph, and then Willie. starts to talk to uh, Willie, who turns around. And then she shoots him through the left temple. Marie kills her brother like it's a household chore. That's over with. After she shot him, she said, well, that's over with. Get out. Get rid of it. I wouldn't think that William would ever have guessed that his own sister would have killed. <laughs> what brother would think that someone would do that, a family member would do that? They dragged his body out into a field. And it was very, very seldom used. So they thought that was a good place to dump him. the next morning Willie's bride is getting ready for her big day that will never come William's fiance Irene was waiting for him to meet her at the house he never showed up and she had no way of knowing why must be a horrible moment Irene's heartbreak is complete when William's body is found dumped in a field the tragic story grips the press and the community. But there will still be a wedding. One day after he had been murdered, a reporter went to his house and he described uh, what he called it was all sorts of revelry, uh, drinking, partying, music, loud music, uh, obviously a very good time. Hey, handsome. Are you Marie Porter? Yes, I am. I'm reporting here about your brother, Willie. Uh, oh. oh, yeah, Willie. Marie? It's supposed to be for William and Irene. Marie's opportunism rings an alarm for investigators. Because they seem to be having a big celebration, and here the brother has just been found with a bullet in his head. That was found in the car you rented. Can you explain that? They put the heat on her young employee, Ralph, who has a suspicious rash on his arm. Ralph had dumped William's body out in the field, and he got poison ivy on his arm. Police had noticed that there was a lot of poison ivy in that field. And when that was revealed to Ralph, then he began to spill beans. She did it. I was just the driver. A confession? bullet shells, and blood-stained clothes seal Ralph's fate. Pistol is in my shed in a cigar box. And he takes his brother and his boss with him. Ralph testified against her at trial. The jury found Marie and Ralph guilty of murder, and they were sentenced to be electrocuted. Marie showed no emotion. On January 28, 1938, Ralph Giancola dies in the electric chair. Ten minutes later, Marie Porter is executed for first-degree murder. Before she was executed, uh, she said that she uh, did not hold any malice toward anyone and said, my God, have mercy on my soul. <laughs> Oh. Uh...
Well, she had no mercy for Willie. So who knows what God would think of her? The Great Depression causes many people to do things they wish they hadn't. Do you want your $800 or not? I'll pay you back. Usually because they had to. Why would they spend any money? Marie Porter doesn't have that excuse. I think Marie knew exactly what she was doing. I don't think that Marie cared about many other people. Everything was about her. If Willie hadn't been worth more dead than alive, he wouldn't have been murdered. This killing was motivated by revenge and greed. Want to know more about the women featured in tonight's episode? Visit us online. You're going to jail. When you have money, you can count on two things. Money became more important than anything. Others will want it. The oldest motive on the books. Old-fashioned greed. And you'll never really be safe. This might be the true definition of a deadline. Texas, ranching country. It could be a hard life if you don't have enough help. 41-year-old Jerry Sternadel needs a hand. Jerry's having problems with the business, but it's the good kind. He's too busy. He can't keep up with all the accounting. So tell me, do you have any bookkeeping experience? Uh, no, but I'm really good with figures and I learn fast. His wife, 36-year-old Luann, thinks her good friend, 25-year-old Deborah Lynn Baker, is the answer. We'll give you two weeks to prove yourself. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sternadel. <laughs> Jerry's wife, Luann, begged him to take on Deborah as an accountant, but she had no background in that field. Jerry is a tough boss. You either loved him or hated him. He would do anything for you if he liked you. And if he didn't like you, well, watch it out. Jerry's first wife, Jeannie Walker, says his abrasive manner grew with his wealth. This day you were half an hour late, and you promised me it would never happen again. And he started treating people pretty bad. And he said, if you've got money, you can do anything you want to do. And everybody else will do whatever you want to do. Wife Luann and her friend know how Jerry can be. The girls are always there for each other if things get tough. That's great. Oh, wow. Oh, try it on. They were a lot closer than even sisters might be, you know, and everywhere Luann went, Luann was never without Deborah. They start to hang out together. They start to go have a couple of cocktails together. They start to get to yapping, and they become what? Yeah. BFFs. <laughs> For eight years, it's a happy trio. Until 1990, when Jerry finds he has a problem. All of a sudden, his checks are bouncing all over the place. This can't be, Jerry says. This can't be. We're making a lot of serious discrepancies here. And the CPA said, Jerry, we've got some discrepancies here in the bank accounts. How much are we talking? Around 35000 35000 from this account alone. He said, I found about 35000 missing from one account. There are a lot of transfers to Deborah Baker's account. Did you authorize those? No, I did not. The question is, was it a mistake or embezzlement. It's unbelievable. A furious Jerry confronts Deborah and his wife. That's the date I go to the police if you haven't paid me every cent that you've been stealing from me. What are you talking about? You know exactly what I'm talking about. He thinks they are in cahoots. I know you're in on this. Jerry gives Deborah a deadline to pay back the money. Let's take a the books. He said, I damn sure better have my money back by Memorial Day. Or he'll call the police. He said he was going to have her arrested because she was embezzling money from him. And file for divorce. This might be the true definition of a deadline. 
As Memorial Day looms, there's no sign of the money. But Jerry has something else to worry about. Suddenly, Jerry becomes ill. He begins having problems with his stomach. He begins vomiting a lot. Lots of diarrhea. Lots of aches and pains. Something's wrong. You'll be fine. The doctor's gonna keep you for a few more days. It could be a viral infection, but only tests will tell. And it seems the virus is going around the ranch. A house guest, 19-year-old Tom Bradley, also falls ill. I decided to help myself to some crane apple juice in the refrigerator. Tom remembers it to this day. Instantly, when I took a drink, it started burning. I would say probably within 10 minutes, I was sick on the floor. He's sick as a horse. He was so sick that they took him up to the hospital. Sharing the same mysterious symptoms, these two men have one other thing in common. The juice. It's Jerry's favorite. Well, you've got two people sick, two people drinking the same juice. Now, either the juice is bad, or somebody's making it bad. Texas, 1990. Just outside of Wichita Falls, in the small town, is on hold while he battles a mystery illness. diarrhea, stomach cramps, uh, really sick, throwing up, deathly ill. Just be still now. Be still. The day before Memorial Day, the money had not been put back, and Jerry mysteriously became very, very ill. Coincidence? Jerry doesn't think so. We need some help in here. He tells the medical staff the two women in his life are responsible. When a person's sick in a bed, vomiting, fighting for his life, says he thinks he's being poisoned, they should be listened to. He's probably right. Where he's going to get the lunch? Test results confirm. Jerry hasn't got a virus. Yeah, enough arsenic in him to kill an elephant. The thing about arsenic is, it just doesn't wind up in your system. Somebody put it there. Doctors now know what's wrong with Jerry, but they can't cure him. Once arsenic, at a lethal level, enters your system, there's no turning back. Once it gets into your organ... ...gets into your organs, that's it. Arsenic is a terrible, terrible way to go. They were going to keep doing everything they could, but he didn't have a chance. Jerry dies on June 12th, 1990. Soon after... Can I speak to the police commissioner, please? The police receive an anonymous call from the hospital. A man has died here in hospital. A millionaire by the name of Jerry Sternadel. He had very high levels of arsenic in his body. I think he may have been murdered. No, I don't want to give my name. But police have little evidence until a teenager comes forward. I had to go to the hospital. Then Thomas, the kid who was staying over at the house and ended up in the hospital, he comes forward. Ha, listen, I got sick too. From drinking Jerry's favorite juice. The vomiting and diarrhea and just, you know, just out of it, you know, just hurting. Tom volunteers to be tested. My test results came back at the lead. I said, we well, definitely ingested arsenic. 
So cops are interested in this, big time. The police search Jerry's ranch. They find a trash pile, and lo and behold, a cranberry juice bottle. But there's something odd. That cranberry juice bottle had soap suds on the inside. I wonder why they'd be trying to wash out a cranberry juice bottle that they're going to throw away. It is a sloppy cleanup. Inside the cap, they find traces of arsenic. There's poison, but who put it there? Trash isn't the only thing the murderer leaves lying around. A guy who owns a storage unit facility calls up police and says, I think you ought to get down here. He had someone who hadn't paid her bill. Well, he goes into the storage unit, and what does he find in there? He finds all kinds... He finds all kinds of documents relating to Jerry. The police find something of even greater interest. Hey, what is this? They find a bottle of arsenic. What could be better evidence? The unit is registered to Kathy Simmons. Well, it was in a fictitious name. But the name had the address of Debbie Baker out in Holiday, Texas. That was Debbie Baker's address. In 1994, Deborah Lynn Baker goes on trial for murder. Prosecutors argue she couldn't return Jerry's money, so she moved his deadline permanently. The jury agreed that Deborah Baker poisoned Jerry to death. She had the ulterior motive, she had the means to do it, and the opportunity. Deborah also wanted to help Luann, who was never accused of any involvement in the crime. She did it to help out her friend, and she didn't want her friend to get divorced because she knew she wouldn't wind up with anything. Deborah Lynn Baker is found guilty of... Astonishingly, she isn't sentenced to a single day in prison. That should have resulted in a heavy prison sentence, but oddly, she got 10 years probation instead. We were all stunned after she had been given first-degree murder then they come back with probation. The surprise leniency comes courtesy of the jury. Did Deborah get away with murder? And in some respects, she did. In other respects, she has to live with herself. Nine years later, old habits catch up with Deborah Lynn Baker. When Deborah was on probation, she wrote a forged check in another county, basically a violation of her parole from the murder trial. For that crime, she was sentenced to 10 years in prison. She gets ultimately 10 years for all those crimes. Ten years for killing a man and forgery. It's remarkable, really. These deadly women saw family and friends as dollar signs. Maureen McDermott swindled her housemate to death. Marie Porter killed her own brother for easy money. And Deborah Lynn Baker took a life to balance the books. They all put their desires before lives. They had a hunger for cash. Thank you for watching Investigation Descent.
teenage angst is a part of life. But some girls' emotions run too deep to control. I told you not to talk to her! A high school student's quiet reserve masks a deeper horror. This act was close and personal, and it would have took a very violent and angry person. Your lift. There is nothing childlike about one girl's thoughts. What did she call me? She knew she was going to kill that night. And no one will stand in the way of a love-struck teen. We're done. She's a textbook sociopath. Do it right. No remorse, no empathy, no conscience. For these deadly women, murder is child's play. They are never too young. in the remote desert town of West Wendover, Nevada. 18-year-old Tony Fratto leads a quiet life. She was a very shy, withdrawn girl, very intelligent, uh, very diligent in her work. Then everything changes when she meets 18-year-old student Cody Patton. Cody! Tony falls head over heels. I missed you. I've only got him. She put all her cards into Cody. Well, what can I say? I'm in love. I can't be happy without him. He's the world. Hi. Tony definitely was upset with Cody. romance becomes more serious when the pair talks of marriage. We have some good news. We're getting married. Tony's parents worry. Their daughter's too young. I'll be back. We're gonna go tell Cody's dad. And Cody is a bad boy. Cody had a reputation for having problems throughout his life with anger. Still so young. What if they are? One day, he'd be sweet and attentive and a good student, and the next, a holy terror. The teen love and open their home to Cody. What's your favorite message? They're very good people, and I believe that they thought they could help him with being a constructive family. A glory in my Jesus. He had redeemed my soul. A glory in truth. It's so great he's living here. They'll also be able to keep an eye on their, their daughter. I still think you should wait a little longer. I love him. He loves me. But Tony is not the only girl in Cody's life. He still hangs out with childhood friend, 16-year-old Michaela Costanza, or Mickey. They've grown up together. No romantic interests. They're just like best buddies and that becomes a problem for his new fiance Michaela was very pretty very outgoing very athletic the things that the Tony wasn't thank you I told you not to talk to her I've known her forever well yeah I told you and you don't listen I love you oh no you don't you don't only love me Tony! Tony's insecurities start eating her up. Tony's diaries revealed what she was really feeling and thinking. That Cody was eventually going to leave her for another woman. It really shows that Tony didn't have much self-worth. She had low self-esteem. And that comes out in many different ways. Tony goes on the offensive. Who do you think you are? There's one day when Tony is giving Mickey a real hard time, you know, bullying her, calling her names. Tony, I have a boyfriend. What do you want with my man? That sort of thing. Just stay away! (sighs) 
Then Cody does something that surprises everyone. Cody had a box cutter and cut Michaela's arm and thought it was so much funny and laughed about it. You're insane! So Mickey responds by saying, this guy is crazy. And he's likely crazy because he's with a crazy girlfriend. What should I say? Meet up. Thanks to Tony's jealousy, a lifelong friendship is falling apart. But Cody didn't like that. On March 3rd, 2011, the school parking lot is deserted, except for Cody. He's waiting for Mickey to finish track practice. Mickey goes out of the back of the school. And Cody's waiting for her. Because he knows where she exits the building every day. Cody, you shouldn't be here. Hey, I just want to show you something. He's got an SUV waiting there. You want to show me something? And he gets her over to that SUV. Somebody here? Mickey still has trust in her lifelong friend. But she shouldn't. Whoever came along that got in between Tony and Cody, whether it was innocent or not, was going to be a problem. In 2011, in West Wendover, Nevada, Teens Tony Fratto and her fiancé Cody Patton are at war with Michaela Costanza. On March the 3rd, Cody sets out to prove his devotion. Cody grabs Michaela while she was coming out of school, finds her, and throws her in the back of his SUV. It's time for her to pay. Then he sends a text in crime and says I've got her that tells me this was in the planning for a long time and the plan was murder I couldn't imagine the intense fear that girl went through shut up to a deserted location known as the gravel pits. It's going to be the last place that Mickey sees, unfortunately. Cody! Cody, please! ends with senseless cruelty. <laughs> Cody was friends with this girl. But yet here he is participating in this murder. Why? Well, Tony has control over him. She said her legs and helped cut her throat it was very up close and personal it was very very violent tony and cody could have killed michaela quickly and with a lot less violence but that isn't what they wanted bury her in a shallow grave and drive away like it's just any other day. That's cold-hearted. That's evil. At its core. When a 16-year-old girl goes missing, it's not a secret for long. Her worried parents call police, who start talking to Mickey's peers. Tony and Cody were contacted that evening, and both denied knowing where she was. But the school's security cameras tell another story. They begin to look at some surveillance video taken from the school. And that's 
where they see Cody. So Cody has some explaining to do. The bravado he displayed while beating his friend to death deserts Cody Patton under police interrogation. Cody tells the story of the murder and what happened. He had done it and confessed that he had done it alone. What Cody doesn't say is who helped him. He doesn't even mention Tony's name. They have no reason to believe she was even there. Tony Fratto is about to get off scot-free until she confides in the wrong person. It's okay, Tony. Cody's father. Are you sure this is how Cody? After Cody was arrested, Tony was speaking with his father and told him that she was present when Michaela was murdered. Cody's father didn't even wait for her to get dressed. In her pajamas, he drove her to Cody's lawyer's office. I don't know whether she thought she was implicating herself or she thought that maybe this was going to cast a shadow of a doubt for Cody's case. Oh, slit her throat. I don't know what her reasoning was. In 2012, the pair is found guilty of murder. Cody Patton receives life with no parole for first-degree murder. Tony Fratto pleads guilty to second-degree murder. She is sentenced to life with the possibility of parole after 18 years. I don't believe it's something any of the community is ever going to forget. Michaela Costanza will be grieved for many years to come. A wonderful life cut short by her lifelong friend. It's astounding to me how easy it was for Cody to turn on his childhood friend, Michaela. Where's the motive for Cody to kill this girl, this childhood friend of his? Tony has a motive. Cody doesn't really have a motive other than being loyal to Tony. A crime can be so horrific. I could not believe a girl was capable of this type of focused rage and anger. So disturbing. She wrote, I wish I could kill you again. Terrified screams turn me on. It's almost unbelievable. She's a natural born killer. City of Camberley, England, 1991. 11-year-old Sharon Carr is popular with both students and teachers. At school, her friends recalled Sharon as being yeah, a pretty sociable kid. A polite, helpful girl. Hey, miss. Hi, Sharon. But her happy exterior is paper thin. Inside Sharon is a lost little girl. Sharon Carr's early life was classically tragic. One of four kids uh, her mother had by three different men. Um, she was given little attention. A string of father figures are in and out of her life. So is violence. When Sharon was only seven, both her mother and her mother's live-in partner were hospitalized for a violent... Sharon! This is a big problem for children to see something like that. It can leave scars. Come on, boy. To the outside world, Sharon seems fine. But inside, a storm is brewing. Before her 12th birthday, 
Sharon lashes out at a neighborhood pet. From a very young age, Sharon was involved in some very disturbing incidents. She is used a shovel to decapitate a dog. When a child tortures or kills animals, they're trying to take control of their life. They can dominate power, control, and their sadistic tendencies over a helpless animal. That's what Sharon liked to do. Her mother can't control Sharon. She places her in foster care. Come on, Sharon. Let's see you do home. When a child knows nothing but stress, they grow up hyper attuned waiting for the next bad event to happen. When Sharon was removed from her mother's home and put in foster care, things did not go well. A month later, she's back home. Not just angry, but rejected. Her dark world is set to explode. Sharon was completely lacking emotion and extremely cold in her outlook on everything. Sharon was used to chaos, and so she created her own. The English city of Camberley, in the early hours of Friday, June 6th, 1992. 12-year-old Sharon Carr is cruising the streets, looking for fun with two male friends. Normally, it would be putting boundaries, no rules. If there were, she broke them anyway. Also out on the town is 18-year-old hairdresser, Katie Ratcliffe. But her night ends in tears when she bumps into a former boyfriend. Katie had actually recently split up from a boyfriend. I'm really sorry, but she found out he was dating another girl. And this clearly upset her. The dejected hairdresser is vulnerable when the girls' worlds collide. Oi, darling, you want a cigarette? It's 2 30 in the morning. Katie is outside the nightclub. They've shut the doors. She's pretty tipsy from the alcohol she's consumed. She's still very upset. Really nice you want a lift? Katie thought she was getting a ride home. It's obvious that Sharon was not threatening in any way to Katie. What's wrong? Boy issues. Otherwise, she would never have accepted the lift with Sharon and those two boys. But Katie is not going home. She's driven to an isolated park. of practicing on animals. I don't think Katie did anything to set Sharon off. Sharon knew she was going to kill that night. Katie was the unlucky victim. Sharon's friends do nothing to help Katie. Katie must have been in disbelief. Then she would have doubled over, feeling all of the pain, feeling the blows from that knife cutting through and through her. Sharon will record in her diary what she is thinking that night. She wrote, killing for me is a mass turn on. It makes me so high. She enjoyed the act of stabbing and venting her rage. Moreover, it turned her on. Sharon even wrote in her diary 
I wish I could kill you again. Your terrified screams turned me on. And if she could do it again, she would draw out the murder over a longer period of time because she enjoyed Katie's suffering. To her chest, heart, and abdomen. Katie bled to death. She died mainly from internal bleeding. What 12-year-old Sharon does next is almost impossible to believe. My boys, come and help me. She exposed her body, looked at her breasts and genitalia, and then used the knife to cut her. I could not believe a 12-year-old girl was capable of this type of focused rage and anger. I could not believe that a 12-year-old girl would mutilate the genitalia and breasts of an 18-year-old girl. When Katie's body is discovered the next day, everything points to a sex murder. The police thought Katie was killed by a man. It looked like a rape homicide to the police. No one suspects a 12-year-old girl. And her friends don't talk. Sharon is free to go back to being a schoolgirl. Until on the second anniversary of Katie's murder. Ah, what did you do that for? Without provocation, Sharon again resorts to violence. The 7th of June must have meant something to Sharon. It was the day of her first murder, and it looks like she tried to do it again. This time, Sharon is arrested and sentenced to two years in youth detention. And police discover her macabre diary. Sharon admitted to the murder of Katie and the sexual pleasure she gained from that. Sharon's male accomplices are never identified. In March 1997, Sharon Carr, the UK's youngest known murderess, is convicted. Sharon, at 12 years old, was a sadist, a sexual sadist. In prison, Sharon's finally diagnosed as suffering from schizoaffective disorder, a combination of schizophrenia and a mood disorder. Schizoaffective disorder is a condition marked by profound mood swings and periodic psychosis bad combo most people diagnosed with it do have difficult lives but they do not become killers sharon was different sharon gives mental illness a bad name sharon is transferred to a secure mental institution where she could be held indefinitely sharon remains under the care of a mental institution to this day and to this day, few can believe a 12-year-old girl capable of such cruelty. But Sharon's mental instability took hold at a very early age. It's highly unusual for a 12-year-old female to become a sadistic sexual killer. I've never even heard of it before this case. But Sharon was ahead of her time. Teen love can be so sweet. It was a, a fairy tale. But when young hearts clash... She went after the boyfriends of other girls. Romance comes to a bitter end. Together you have this toxic mix. <laughs> in the quiet country town of Livermore, California, in 2002... 17-year-old school student, Jenna Nanetti, has something none of the other girls have. What are you waiting for? 
Hurry it to mattress firm. Coming to you fresh faced from home with new Lash Blast Clean Mascara. 10 times the volume, clean formula that's cruelty free and vegan. Works for me, works for us, works for the planet. New Lash Blast, the clean mascara that works from CoverGirl. This is adventurous. Let's do this. Looking for your favorite paranormal shows? They're creeping to a new home exclusively on Discovery Plus. Tell me you heard that. All of the paranormal premieres, <gasps> new exclusive originals, and thousands of episodes. Wow. Only in one place, starting at $4.99. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. I am fired up. The streaming home for paranormal. Discovery Plus. Download and stream now. In Livermore, California, two 17-year-old girls love for the same man. Mike Simons turns to war. On October the 6th, 2002, Katie Bellflower lashes out at Mike's wife, Jenna Nanetti. Mike convinces Jenna to hunt down Katie and seek revenge. I know where Katie is. Let's go get her. She's hanging out at Whiskey Slew. Mike drives to an isolated area of the Delta. Waiting there for Michael and Jenna were Katie Bellflower and Jeffrey Hamilton. Are they even gonna come? Yes, okay, just calm down. They'll be here. Driver. Them. Katie had enormous influence and power over Jeff. He would do anything for her. Give me the gun. Jenna has no idea. She's been lured into a trap. Do it right. jealousy they're also greedy the duo want to cash in jenna's life insurance policy katie and mike plan to spend her life insurance proceeds on buying a house and starting a new life 12 days pass before jenna's body is found She's found badly decomposed uh, by a couple of fishermen. Three of the mourners at Jenna's funeral are also the last people to see her alive. I was confident that Michael and Katie had some involvement. But there's no physical evidence tying any of the trio to the crime. able to find the baseball bat we were not able to find the shotgun either might still be today except for another love triangle hey baby i got you a present this is 
Aspen. Just months after Jenna's death, Katie brings a third person into their tryst, a 16-year-old girl called Aspen. She liked to control people. I think that's why she invited Aspen, her friend, in for a three-way with her boyfriend, Mike. But when Katie becomes pregnant, she is in no mood for sharing. Catherine Bellflower became pregnant uh, with Michael's child and decided that Aspen was in the way. To Katie, the solution is simple. Katie had gotten away with murder. And that emboldened someone, the killer, to do it again. But Katie doesn't want to get her hands dirty. She again recruits Jeff Hamilton. On February 28th, 2003, Katie gets her young teen rival drunk. They plied her with uh, alcohol. Without warning, Jeff begins to choke her violently. As Aspen fights for her life, Katie whispers a chilling promise. I killed Jenna, and now I'm gonna kill you. It's okay. What's going on here? But Fett interrupts. Is she all right? Police officer Tim Phillips is on a routine patrol. I saw one young lady who was laying pretty much on her back. Another young lady that was kneeling next to her, kind of embracing her. It's okay, officer. We got it. I noticed Katie Bellflower was wearing rubber gloves, as was Jeffrey Hamilton. Yeah, yeah. Katie thinks fast. Okay, we got it. She's just a bit sick. <coughs> we loved her in case she vomits. Telling the officer she's not killing Aspen. She's caring for her. She appeared forthright and she was convincing. In an instant, she was able to transition from cold-blooded killer to convince this officer that they were there to provide comfort. It's the perfect chance for Aspen to escape. But she stays silent. Aspen probably didn't tell. But master manipulator Katie loses control when Aspen gets home. Fine. Just, just keep your mouth shut. I love you. She immediately told her parents exactly what had happened. And reveals Katie's admission to killing Jenna. Police quickly arrest the trio. One. I think if Katie hadn't been caught... She would have done it again and again and again. The behavior was becoming repetitive. These deadly women proved youth is no barrier to cruelty. Tony Fratto sacrificed a young life Shut up. for young love. Sharon Carr turned her sick fantasies into reality. And Katie Bellflower put her desires above a life. They had baby face looks, but hard hearts, and were never too young. Thank you for watching Investigation Discovery on. is a game for two. When three try to play, someone will get hurt. Who is this woman anyway? What is she doing um, in my house? An obsessive wife fixates on vengeance. She's consumed with the idea that they're together. I'd do anything for you, Ruth. A lustful affair brings a wicked plot. He was worth ten times his annual salary, dead. And he didn't even know it. Now, where were we? And a wealthy housewife 
keeps more than skeletons in her closet. He's living in the closet in her bedroom, and her husband's down the hall. For these deadly women, two is company, but three's a crowd. Nestled in the foothills of the Rockies, Helena is Montana's idyllic state capital. The mountains are close, they're skiing, floating, fishing. It's a terrific place to live. The perfect place to escape city life. Something Michelle Gable is desperate to do in 2008. She suffered from like an environmental uh, disease, if you will. It made her very sensitive to any type of chemical smell, chemical odor. Modern living makes Michelle sick. She and husband Joe hope the mountain air can improve things. You reek of gasoline. But their relocation isn't quite the breath of fresh air they're counting on. She complained more and more about these sensitivities. She would call up the police department, kind of ranting and raving about her neighbors causing problems. Hey! She, in fact, one day calls the police. You're poisoning me! Because they're outside cutting the lawn. Hey! And the fumes are bothering her. Hey! What are you doing here? Some people stop, stop. do have sensitivity to chemicals. But in Michelle's case, I think it was quite overblown. Michelle used her illness sensitivity to the environment as a manipulative tool to get what she wants husband joe has tried everything but to be expanding joe's at a loss what is he going to do it seems she's sensitive to not only chemicals but everything then in 2009, Michelle becomes distraught when her mother dies. <laughs> she returns to Maryland for the funeral and doesn't come home. She stayed there for a full year, getting asked Joe to come along. She just seemed to be kind of hiding in a house back there. And Joe's back home wondering, what the hell's going on? But he decides, you know what? She's been acting a little nutty anyway, so why don't we just leave it be? The separation stretches from one year into two. Joe finds a new partner, 50-year-old Sunday Bennett. Sunday was described as a fun-loving person. Everybody around her really liked her. She had a certain sparkle about her. And she is everything that Michelle wasn't. She's fun. She's exciting. She's happy. Chemical odors don't bother her. Joe's having the time of his life. Him and Sunday, match made in heaven. Joe thinks his wife has moved on too. Not so. In September 2011, Michelle pays a surprise visit. She walks right into her old house. And Sunday's on the floor sleeping on an air mattress, and Joe's in another room. Joe. Joe. I'm back. Who's that woman? Joe spins a story. Who is that woman? She's just a friend, okay? Michelle's unconvinced. She's still a little bit disturbed by this relationship, but they're not sleeping together. Trying to calm the waters, Joe invites Michelle downstairs to meet his new friend. Hey, why don't we all go out and get some breakfast and get to know each other? She invites Sunday out to breakfast to talk to her. No, sorry, I can't. 
Sunday is like, who is this mad woman? I'm not going to breakfast with her. Is she crazy, out of her mind? The two hiding drive her crazy. There was another woman in Joe's life. Who are you, Joe? Who is Joe? Who are you, Joe? Who are you, Joe? Get out! Now! Michelle leaves, and she decides, I need to check into a motel, and I need to fix things now. It's been long enough. I'm going to fix this relationship. But Joe's not interested in mending fences. He's changing the locks. I'm going to have to go out soon. Yeah, well, I have to get some of my stuff. Michelle could not live with the truth that her husband didn't want her. Not that she wanted him either, but it looked bad for the princess to not have a prince on her arm. After two years of neglecting her marriage, Michelle wants her old life back. She wanted to hang on for the one thing she had, and that was Joe. She was not going to let some other woman take her husband. Two thousand eleven, Helena, Montana. I'm your wife. Michelle, you don't live here anymore. After two years apart, Michelle Gable tries to patch things up with husband, Joe. Please! But he's locked her out and moved in new girlfriend, Sunday. Now Michelle's consumed with Joe, and she's consumed with Sunday, and she's consumed with the idea. They're together. Michelle starts stalking the couple. There's more than love at stake. Joe is her only source of income. Michelle was not taking care of herself financially. She did nothing all day long, except think about herself. Michelle was really keeping tabs on Sunday. She was following her movements, looking into her background, and essentially kind of creating this dark woman in her mind who was her enemy. It becomes all too clear. Joe never wants Michelle back. Hi Joe, this is Michelle. This is the third time that I've called you. Will you please call me? Are you sure you told her it's over? I keep telling her. Joe went to a local judge and tried to get a restraining order to keep her out of the out of the household. The judge said, I don't see any personal danger to you or to Sunday. At his wit's end, that pushes Michelle over the edge. I'm nearly free. Let's hope so. On October 12th, 2011, Joe and Sunday settle in for the night. But they're not alone. Michelle sneaked in and roamed around the house all night long while Joe and Sunday were sleeping. Michelle finds Sunday's phone and decides to play a trick. She texts Sunday's ex-husband as Sunday. Is this a woman whose mind is just becoming unraveled? But Michelle isn't just here for pranks. Michelle got her hands on a 38 revolver and a 9mm semi-automatic that Joe owned. At 6 a.m., Joe awakes to his worst nightmare. What are you doing here? Why is she wandering through the house with two handguns? This woman is prepared to do damage. This woman is prepared to go to war. Joe takes two bullets. Then, Michelle goes after Sunday, who tries to escape to the basement. Sunday runs away from her attacker, Michelle. Sunday at this point has to be pleading for her life. Please don't kill me, please. But Michelle does what? 
She unloads another half a dozen rounds. Critically wounded. Joe calls 911. The police arrive just after daybreak. Joe has been able to crawl to the front of the house where he's still alive but bleeding. Sir, can you speak? What happened? My wife. My wife shot me. But his wife is apparently also wounded, and she tells another story. Sunday Bennett is the shooter. She's in the basement. She says, Sunday's the shooter. She's down in the basement. So they back off. They don't know what the hell's going on now. The police wait for backup. Michelle must have known that Sunday was slowly dying in the house. And I'll bet she loved every minute of it. When the police finally enter the basement an hour later, it's too late. And unfortunately, Sunday died in the basement because nobody could get to her in time. Joe's wounds prove fatal, too. The only survivor is Michelle, who miraculously escaped a hail of bullets with superficial scratches. Investigators don't believe Michelle's story, so she changes it, admitting she did shoot her husband, but she had no choice. Michelle's claim was self-defense, that she shot Joe when he came running at her, and the same thing for Sunday Bennett. The only thing really weak about Michelle was her excuse that she did it in self-defense. That is laughable. Michelle pleads not guilty, claiming justifiable use of force. Let me ask you a question. What justifies murder of two people <laughs> in their own home? No one buys her story. In January 2013, Michelle Gable is found guilty on two counts of first-degree murder. She had... 100 years for each homicide consecutively, which is 200 years. Housed in the Montana Women's Prison, Michelle won't be eligible for parole until she is 99. She is in a place where she absolutely belongs. Michelle Gable always believed her biggest threat was modern chemicals. It turned out to be something far more old-fashioned jealousy if michelle gable had put the energy into improving herself that she put into killing her husband and his girlfriend she could have really made something out of her life some women live a charmed life they were going out on the town going out to restaurants going out to the theater you're a cruel man, Albert. But when the romance fades, once they got married, die. malice can take its place. She was motivated by greed and lust. And that never works out very well. Manhattan, New York, 1914. 19-year-old clerk, Ruth Brown, dials a wrong number. Hello, this is Ruth Brown. I'd like to speak with Henry Pritchett, please. I'm on a deadline and you're wasting my time. And earns the wrath of 32 year old Albert Snyder. She chewed her out on the telephone, and then for some reason, maybe she had a sexy voice that he was attracted to, he called her back to apologize. Hello, Ruth speaking. Hello, Ruth. This is uh, Albert Snyder, the, uh, the cranky man that you just. Albert is immediately drawn to the vivacious teen. 13 years his junior. I apologize in person. 
Okay. She wasn't conventionally beautiful, but she apparently possessed a certain kind of ex intense sexual allure. A smitten Albert pulls out all the stops courting Ruth, dining and dining her. They were going out on the town, going out to restaurants, going out to the theater. He pursued her very, very energetically and finally, I guess, won her over one dinner by offering her a large, dazzling engagement ring. It's beautiful. Working class Ruth has hit the jackpot. Albert was a successful businessman, and Ruth wanted a comfortable life. There's just one fly in the ointment. An old flame. He kept a picture of her in the bedroom that he shared with his wife. Most wonderful woman I've ever known. Jesse Gizzard or J.G., was Albert's fiance, but died before they could marry. He wears a pin of hers, bearing her initials, every day. Ruth decides she can live with J.G.'s ghost. But when baby Lorraine arrives, Ruth finds the romance in her marriage fades. When Albert was chasing Ruth, they went out, they had fun, he spent a lot of money on her, dining. Well, there were two Albert Snyders. There was Albert Snyder the suitor, and there was Albert Snyder the husband. This house is a pigsty. Well, I'm busy taking care of our child. Once they got married, he basically just saw her as a housekeeper. Nothing was really right with the relationship. The age difference, the fact that he wanted to settle down and stay home, she wanted to go out and have a good time. <laughs> Ruth rebels and hits the town. And in 1925, meets her own JG. Did you look at me? Yeah. 34 year old corset salesman. Judd Gray. Judd was this model of incredible middle class propriety with his big glasses and his very, very fastidious way of dress and his church going and his respectable life. Buttoned up Judd already has a wife, child, and a white picket fence. And apparently he was bored stiff. Wild girl Ruth Snyder seems the perfect antidote. I think it was for romance, sex, thrills, but then it turned into something else. Ruth wishes her husband would disappear so she can be with Judd. Things at home are getting worse. If only there's a way to make the dream come true. I need your help. I'll do anything for you. Extramarital affairs can be just that, an affair. It can also be a motivation for murder. Queens, New York, 1925. 32-year-old Ruth Snyder is doing some homework on double indemnity. Good timing. I need you to sign your insurance papers. It's an insurance policy that doubles the payout if her husband dies of unnatural causes. Albert Snyder was worth 10 times his annual salary, dead. And he didn't even know it. Is that it? After 12 years in a loveless marriage, Ruth is ready. Wanted to be a widow. On March 20th, 1927, the Snyder family returns home from a rare night out together. 
Snyder put the car away. He had been drinking very, very heavily at the party. But there's another man in the Snyder house tonight. Ruth's secret lover, Judd. Ruth Snyder came down and said, okay, Judd, are you ready to do it? I think I can. But has this straight-laced corset salesman got what it takes to kill? Judd went in and struck Albert on the head with this five pound lead weight. Albert awoke and uh, began to struggle. Albert might have seen his own wife watching this happen. I can't imagine anything worse. This thing is totally done for me. I am ruined. Albert did not go quickly or quietly. He fought for his life. Ruth douses her husband with chloroform, wraps his head in fabric and his neck in picture wire. Ruth had to take over and deliver the coup de grace to ensure that Albert was dead. They garroted him with a length of picture wire. To complete Ruth's plan, the couple has some stage managing to do. They went around the house just ripping things apart. Cushions were thrown around. To pull off their hopes robbery, there's one finishing touch. After the murder, Judd tied up Ruth. Ruth was quite the actress, but she wasn't a very smart one. Ruth plans to be rescued in the morning by her daughter, Lorraine. But impatience gets the better of her. She woke up Lorraine and told Lorraine, I'm very sick, please go get help. Go get mommy some help, okay? Lorraine alerts neighbors who call the police. It's unlike any crime scene they've ever encountered. One of the policemen evidently shook his head and said, you know, there's something funny. The police did not believe this was a burglary for one minute. Take four of those girls. Ruth insists Albert's been killed in a home invasion and that her jewelry is missing. It didn't take the police long to discover that the jewelry, which Ruth claimed had been stolen by these burglars, was actually located under the mattress of her bed where she had shoved it. Investigators also find Albert's keepsake, his JG pin, but they don't realize it's from his long dead lover. They think the mysterious JG could be the killer. Then in examining Ruth's state book, they found a reference to a man named Judd Gray, and they assume that the Judd Gray of the book was the person who had that JG stick pin. When Ruth was being questioned by the police, she inadvertently gave herself away when one of the cops mentioned Judd's name. Who is Judd Gray? And she said, oh, has he confessed? <laughs> Bye-bye, Ruth. Friend, I don't know it now. Well, I... In a twist of coincidence, the woman who haunted Ruth's marriage ultimately does her in. That J.G. stick pin had nothing to do with Judd Gray. It had belonged to Albert Snyder's beloved dead fiance that he wore next to his heart, but somehow it helped lead to the breaking of this crime. Placed on trial, first degree murder, Judd Gray is found guilty and sentenced to death.
His lover, Ruth, is also found guilty, and she, too, receives the death penalty. I think that she was the driving force. I think that she was the catalyst. It appears to me that Ruth was going to kill Albert one way or another, but I don't think Judd would have ever killed if he hadn't fallen in love with Ruth. In January 1928, Ruth's life of lust, greed, and coincidence comes to an end in the electric chair. Ruth stood by and watched her husband brutally attacked, deadly woman. Wanted. Some women wanted all. They were doing very well and they could afford the lifestyle they had. But too much of a good thing. She once referred to her life as like being on Wisteria Lane leads to trouble in paradise. Love triangles can be dangerous and deadly. I want him gone! in the affluent enclave of Brentwood, Tennessee. <sighs> Business is booming for Martha and Jeffrey Freeman. I never thought we'd grow so fast. Martha and Jeffrey had a company that would do background checks for apartment complexes, employment. Good morning, Resi Fax. It appeared that they were doing very well and they could afford the lifestyle they had. Martha and her husband, Jeffrey, appear to be the perfect, happy, successful, middle-aged couple. They were envied. For 44-year-old workaholic Jeffrey, this is a dream come true. Jeffrey Freeman was a, a very nice, likable guy. I would describe his personality kind of like a, a teddy bear personality. <laughs> Rather be working at home. But his 40-year-old wife, Martha, isn't satisfied with her nice husband and prosperous home. She's looking for more out of life. Martha seemed to have issues, and nobody could find out, couldn't put a handle on what it was. Martha turns to prescription drugs, thinking they might fill the void. I don't know that she needed them all, but she, she took them to keep herself happy, I guess, during the day. But the drugs can't cure a restless soul. So for some excitement, the couple goes for a night out on the town in Nashville. Oh, amazing. <laughs> it's the 4th of July, 2004. Jeff has booked a room in a hotel for the night. But it doesn't turn out to be the party Martha is hoping for. Stay longer. Let's keep partying. Jeffrey didn't want to stay and decided he wanted to go home. You know what most of it. He probably wanted to go home and get up early so he could go to church the next day. Well, I told Martha thought she already had pursuit of excitement. Martha's about to do something reckless. I don't know if she was having some type of midlife crisis. Martha never indicated that she had done anything like this before. Martha meets three Hispanic men and invites them up to her room. Martha may have been a well-off married suburbanite, but she certainly didn't act like it the night of the 4th of July. She has sexual relations with all three of these men. One of the trio is 35-year-old Rafael Roca Perez. He was from Mexico. He was here in the country illegally. He was a very large, sturdy guy. In Rafael, Martha finds the excitement she's been longing for. She decides he's more than a one-night stand and dumps her husband for him. Martha moved out of the house, moved into another local hotel, and had Raphael move in with her. Como esta? Como esta usted? Raphael speaks no English, and Martha knows Spanish. 
Yet for six months in the hotel, their relationship grows stronger. Martha obtains somewhere some some type of a a machine, a device that allow them to communicate with each other. But then Martha starts running out of conversation and cash. Do you have any money? She needs back the husband she dumped. Jeffrey Freeman was a very forgiving person. I just want to come home. How can I believe you? I'm so sorry. I believe he loved Martha deeply. I believe he wanted their marriage to work. Let me come home. Jeffrey allows Martha back into their idyllic home. But the couple still don't share a marital bed. She slept in a separate room. Jeffrey stayed in the master bedroom. Arthur. Why'd you lock the door? I just got in the habit of living in the hotel. For Martha, the sleeping arrangements are perfect. I'm off the office. She returns with more than her belongings. Now, where were we? Martha moved Raphael in. She had him living in her closet in her bedroom. Martha's behavior was, well, some would say crazy. Having a man live in your bedroom closet. Martha feels she has the best of both worlds. A rich husband and a secret lover under the same roof. But how long can this last? What did Martha and Raphael think was going to happen? He's living in the closet in her bedroom and her husband's down the hall. March 2005, in the upscale neighborhood of Brentwood, Tennessee. For over a month, Martha Freeman has a secret lover holed up in her closet. How are you? How do you? The closet had a pallet in it, a makeshift bed, uh, food. Husband Jeffrey sleeps in another room and doesn't suspect a thing. Are you? Jeffrey was addicted to his job and he spent most of the day well into the evening at work Jeffrey hears a strange noise coming from Martha's room. What the heck? Hey, wake up! No, Jeffrey, it's all right. Who is this? It's just a threat. He woke Martha and asked, why is there a man in the closet? And that there was an argument at that point. told her, I'm going to go walk the dog. When I come back, he better be gone. Now, Martha has to choose. Her live-in lover of a few months, or her forgiving husband of ten years. For all the years Martha and Jeffrey were married, and what they accomplished in their life, in the end, it meant nothing to Martha. She wanted to do what she wanted to do, and that included getting rid of Jeffrey. I'm in here. Is he gone? Yes. Is he gone? He used the butt of the shotgun to beat him with. Her idea to put the plastic bag over his head to keep blood from getting on her house. He was strangled with a, a large amount of telephone cord that we found with the body. Martha 
Martha wanted Jeffrey dead so she could have all the money, all the stuff. Almost as shocking as the murder is what Martha wants next. They celebrated by having sex in the living room with her husband's body nearby. The fact that a woman had just participated in the murder of her husband and then had sexual relations shows such a cold black heart. Martha's next desire is self-preservation. After betraying her husband, she now betrays her lover. A man killed my husband. Martha runs across the street to her neighbor, bangs on the door, and says, this man has killed my husband. I, I know who killed my husband. She names the culprit as her lover, Raphael. And the police find him hiding nearby. Martha says he murdered her husband alone while she was in the house. When we asked Martha why she didn't leave the home, make a call, or do something to assist Jeffrey, she said she just didn't have an answer for that. There's something else that's strange. For someone who is supposed to be innocent, Martha knows a lot of detail of the murder. In one breath, she's saying, I don't know what happened. But in the next breath, she's saying, well, I know this man murdered my husband. So how did she know that if she wasn't participating in it? The cops wise up, and Martha soon joins her lover on trial for slaying her husband. They were both charged with first-degree murder. Martha and Raphael both pleaded not guilty. In September 2005, Rafael Roca Perez is found by sentence, which in Tennessee is 51 years before you meet the parole board. Martha Freeman is also found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life. The woman who wanted excitement and got it with drugs. Group sex a secret lover, and murder pays a heavy price. I'm in here. Martha was not mentally ill. She didn't hear voices. She was not delusional. Martha liked risk. Love triangles can be dangerous and deadly. Rather than divorce, these deadly women lashed out at those they'd once loved. Michelle Gable's marriage dissolved into malice. Ruth Snyder valued her husband more dead than alive. And Martha Freeman's search for excitement led her down a depraved path. These deadly women lived by the vindictive code Three's a crowd. Thank you for watching Investigation Discovery on Demand. To get away with murder. Oh, you make me so happy. The best disguise is a smile. I've got a little present for you. A high-flying businesswoman plots vicious vengeance. They described it as a bloodbath. A widow is unlucky in love. Again and again. She got away with it and she got money. And a caring grandmother masks a dark past. She doesn't have no conscience charm and a kind word these deadly women hide in plain sight daring the law to catch me if you can vancouver canada 
1991. Two women from very different backgrounds forge a close bond. Their children went to the same school. And then friendships sort of blossom from there. I love your necklace. Thank you. Gift for my father. 40-year-old Gladys Wakabayashi is the daughter of a Taiwanese billionaire. Here's long life and success. 53-year-old Jean James makes her own way to the top. Jean James was a successful professional woman who was the head of a large union of flight attendants. Despite their differences, the women have one thing in common. Their smiles mask secret heartbreak. Gladys's marriage is on the rocks. Just wasn't working. She turns to Jean for comfort. Gladys separated from her husband, and uh, they were living apart. Marital problems are something Jean knows all about. Jean and Derek. James seemed to have it all. Money, good reputations, everything, except a happy marriage. Jean secretly suspects her husband, Derek, is fooling around. You're home, girlie. Really? There were tensions in the marriage uh, that, that became apparent. Oh, uh, you don't know them. They're from out of town. And her suspicions are right. Derek had, had had a number of affairs. Jean turns a blind eye until she fears Derek is straying close to home. She had expressed that concern to a number of her friends. She was quite upset. She hires a private investigator to find out the truth. Check and see who he's been calling. She had somebody uh, obtain the hotel records of, of Derek's business trip to Toronto, Eastern Canada. The records reveal her worst fear. I'm going to go to bed now. Jean's husband is having an affair with her close friend, Gladys. She was particularly upset because Gladys was a friend of hers. She felt, I think, a real sense of betrayal. <laughs> Jean apparently accepted that her husband had had many affairs. But when she found out he was having an affair with a friend of hers, it drove her over the edge. Inside, Jean is crushed. But she doesn't show it. It went down the same way as the rest of her professional life did. Cool, calm, and collected. Hurt by two people she loves. Jean displays an unexpected emotion. Hi, Gladys. It's Jean. Kindness. Oh, great. I've got a little present for you. Jean wanted to visit Gladys and, and told her that she had a gift for her. See you soon. Bye. What have you done, Jean? <laughs> I saw this. I knew it would be perfect for you. Jean. Since Gladys was having an affair with Jean's husband, there had to have been some unspoken tension between the women. Oh, it's beautiful. I love it. Gladys would be trying very hard to act as if nothing was wrong. Shall I try it on? But this friendly gesture... Let me. She tricked her by bringing her a necklace. She tricked her by saying, let me put it on your neck for you. I know you're sleeping with my husband. <laughs> Silly Jean. Don't you laugh at me. Illicit affairs 
monsters can be very exciting and very deadly. Vancouver, June 24th, 1992. 53-year-old Jean James is a woman scorned. And now her husband's lover, close friend, 41-year-old Gladys Wakabayashi, is at her mercy. I know you're sleeping with my husband. Gladys's neck was exposed. Don't you laugh at me. This would have put her in an extremely vulnerable position. No, not you, no. Jean makes a superficial cut, deep enough to weaken Gladys, but not to kill her. Jean wanted information. She wanted to know how long the affair had been going on. Jean's aim is to torture a confession out of Gladys. She repeatedly stabbed her in the chest and uh, other parts of the body. It was a, it was a real bloodletting. But Gladys either won't or can't respond. And finally, she runs out of patience. Then she slashed her in the neck, cutting through Gladys' joker vein. Gladys had to die. Perhaps she feared losing her husband to her friend. Or perhaps the fact that her friend was having sex with her husband was just too much to bear. <laughs> when investigators got there, they described it as a bloodbath. And in Gladys's blood, a telltale clue. A shoe print. Um, a high-heeled shoe. The print suggests the killer is a woman. Licit affair. They have a prime suspect. Jean James. Are these all your shoes? Yes, they're all in there. Did you go to her house on June 24? No. So they searched the house, they searched the car, and they weren't able to find anything. No. Thank you, ma'am. Jean had taken her revenge and left no trace. Jean was a smart woman. She planned this crime down to the last detail. They had basically insufficient evidence to lay charges, so the, 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 that's where the case uh, rested at that point. The investigation stalls. And as quickly as she turned to murder, Jean switches back to being a regular housewife. Appearance as she was just, you know, an ordinary uh, middle class citizen living her life out in a nice suburb of Vancouver. I need a cash offer. Then, in 2007, 16 years after Gladys's murder, Jean gets an unlikely chance to dabble again in a life of crime. An acquaintance asks her to be a money launderer for a drug ring. Unbelievably, the now 70-year-old Jean wants in. You interested? I am. She probably figured she got away with murder once. Why not make a career of it? Jean wants to climb the crime syndicate ladder. On November 27, 2007, she goes to meet Mr. Big. How do I know you can handle the big stuff? You don't worry. Killers just love to talk. They can't talk to just anyone about killing. But if they think they're in good company, they will brag. 
to prove she is ruthless enough to join the gang's inner circle. Jean reveals her most closely guarded secret. I found my husband screwing around, so I decided to kill her. Kill her. I see her throat and let her bleed up. Jean has been duped. The entire scenario is an undercover sting run by Canadian police. She never thought that law enforcement would lay a trap for her and that she would walk right into it and admit to everything. After 16 years, her big mouth finally traps Jean. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police are known for always getting their man. This time, they got their woman. For the family of Gladys Wakabayashi, justice at last. Jean is convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to 25 years to life. So she'll probably never uh, see the light of day again. Jean wanted to keep bad company. And now she is. If you can't put a price on love. She immediately went out and bought a $250 life insurance policy. Can you put a price on marriage? You were really subjecting them to an agonizing death. For some women, the answer is yes. How she got away with it, and she got money. Annie Barber, so pleased you could make it. In New Haven, Connecticut, 1907, Annie Palman is an unexpected guest on the social scene. Nice to meet you. Annie was a widow after the death of her first husband in 1906. I'm surprised to see Annie here. She's not one for the morning long. And I don't think you've met Joseph Monahan. No, I haven't had the pleasure. The pleasure. It's all mine. It is unusual for a recent widow to be socializing. I thought you two could be partners. Annie's never been afraid to break the rules. A splendid idea. Annie wasn't one for protocol and custom. It's like that. Okay. She liked to have her own way. Tell people what she wants and expect them to do it. <laughs> she didn't take guff off of anybody. She's out of cards. <laughs> Annie's charm is legendary. It lets her get away with most anything. I feel we should warn Joseph. Hush, dear. Annie was arrested for and they released her. 38-year-old Joseph Monahan ignores the gossip. He's smitten. I can't wait that husband's close. What? Why? He doesn't need him. After a short courtship, they marry. Now let's not talk about this. It was all about Annie and what Annie wanted. And in her mind, Why, Mrs. what Annie wanted, Annie got. His family welcomes Joseph's new bride, particularly his younger brother, John. Hey, I brought John home for dinner. You don't mind it? Of course not. Hi. Whiskey? Sure, yeah. It's good to see you again. Looking stunning as always. Oh, John. Annie's allure has no bounds. Neither does her appetite for men oh, okay. Sorry. Oh. which is just as well she's having a run of bad luck a little over a year into annie's new marriage joseph becomes sick annie nurses him brother but he slides downhill it's worse it's long and slow and horrible Unexpected death, 
and once again she was questioned. He wanted to be bombed. We can arrange that. But whatever suspicions police have, they can't lead the charge. That tells me she was probably pretty good at talking to the police. Annie's legendary charm doesn't just work on cops. She's already lined up her next husband and raises eyebrows. Only two months after her second husband died, she married his younger brother, John. The priest said to her, Before we continue, I'm compelled to ask you a question. It's only been a month since your husband died. And this man has the same last name as, as your previous husband. Are they at all related? And Annie stood there, looked in the priest's eyes, and told her bald-faced lie. Absolutely not. Annie married her third husband when she was under suspicion for murder. Marriage comes a new life insurance policy. She immediately went out and bought a $250 life insurance policy on John Monahan for the sum of 15 cents a week. This marriage lasts for a while at least. <laughs> Annie's 17-year-old niece, Jenny McNamee, comes to stay. Trouble returns. Jenny had lost both of her parents. Her mother was Annie's sister. So, of course, Annie took her in. Jenny settles in well to her new home. A little too well for Annie's liking. Jenny, don't you have chores to do? She's having fun. A little too much, I'd say. strikes again not Annie's husband her niece just rest quiet but the ever cautious Annie has insured her too just in case Annie insured her 17 year old niece with three different life insurance companies for a grand total of $2,400 that was a lot of money back then Jenny's doctors think it could be food poisoning. She just needs a rest. All they knew was that she had stomach and intestinal trouble. They didn't know what was wrong. If it was gastrointestinal issues, it was usually attributed to spoiled food. Sometimes people die from that. If they're living with Annie, it's probably another reason. Connecticut, 1913. Annie Monahan looks on as her 17-year-old niece, Jenny McNamee, loses her fight with a mysterious illness. She's not suffering anymore. She should never have suffered. Annie's run of misfortune is becoming a little too much to believe dead unexpectedly then a niece 17 years old completely healthy before she came under annie's care the investigators were very suspicious of annie with mounting circumstantial evidence police order an autopsy on jenny's body they found enough arsenic in her body to kill six people. Police exhume Annie's two husbands to look for more arsenic. But she's one step ahead. He, he wants to be embalmed. Of course. The fact that they were embalmed with liquid arsenic meant she could never be caught.
for poisoning them with arsenic. The case crumbles. There is no way to prove Annie gave her niece the poison. There just didn't seem to be enough evidence to successfully prosecute. How dare they screw my grenade! Annie may be free and rich thanks to another insurance payout, but there's trouble brewing with her husband. That's because you're a murderer. when they would argue and fight, he would call her a murderer. He had no idea how accurate that was. Annie could have tried to talk her husband around, but that's not her style. Eat up, John. Mm. <laughs> it could be argued that arsenic murder is a much more sadistic way of killing somebody than, let's say, the way Jack the Ripper killed his victims. For a fourth time, Annie Monaghan watches a loved one's drawn-out demise. Before Annie can have another husband embalmed, the police strike. They weren't fooling around this time. They sent all of his internal organs to Yale Medical School for analysis. Results show fatal arsenic levels. Coupled with evidence. At her trial, Annie shouted, I'm innocent. You've tried to get me every time. I'll take that as a confession. February 1919, Annie Monahan is found guilty of the murder of her husband, John. She is sentenced to life in prison, where she dies, a notorious serial killer. Annie needed two things in life to be happy, a victim and a bottle of arsenic. People like to believe you can escape your history. They viewed her as, as, as bad news. But some women... That promiscuous behavior signals something bad is going on. ...will never outrun their past. <laughs> she doesn't have no conscience. Seven, Pulaski, Tennessee. 64 year old house cleaner Linda McElroy takes pride in her work. She was considered by people that knew her in the community to be a wonderful woman. Linda's been here in Pulaski for 35 years. Locals think they know her, they don't. Linda would have had to have been constantly looking over her shoulder, waiting for the little idyllic life that she built for herself just to come crashing down around her. You don't think that you're going to find somebody like this in your small town. Hi, Sheriff. Come on in. What can I do you for? Linda? You need to come with me. almost 50 years to 1961 in the riverside city of ashland kentucky linda is an 18 year old stay-at-home mom no you're not go to sleep in her first marriage linda had four children little kids 
but the teen wife can't wait to treat it as being um, a woman who liked to have a good time. I, uh, I'm going to suicide. You're always going down. Are you kidding? I stay at home all day with the kids. Okay. But what her husband doesn't know is that Linda's not meeting her girlfriends. Linda and Charles started seeing one another while Linda was still married to her first husband. She would go out and sneak out with Charles. 17-year-old Charles Darby is head over heels for Linda. Charles Darby was known as a very hardworking, very industrious type individual. He was a sweet person, very funny, uh, very energetic. I hate going back to him. Do you mean that? Yeah, <laughs> I do. Charles persuades Linda to divorce her husband. There was a little bit of a scandal over that. That type of behavior is very much frowned upon in a very small, close-knit, conservative community like Ashland. In 1962, Charles marries Linda. The newlyweds move to Hammond, Indiana, far from Charles's family. Her husband chose her and became isolated and estranged from his own family big mistake seven years later Charles struggles to support Linda's four children and one of their own Ready or not, here I come. neither of them had uh, regular employment they're getting by on what Charles was bringing in through his carpentry business which wasn't much Linda treats herself to fine clothes anyway oh shoot neglecting the bills they got their gas cut off and it cold their electric was cut off and he found out she wasn't paying the bills when confronted about the unpaid bills linda comes up with a shocking revelation i gave you money for the bill about where the money's gone you spent it on yourself on a doctor's appointment She'd been going to the doctor, and she told him she had cancer. Well, they didn't have any insurance where he was self-employed. It's tragic, heartbreaking, and entirely make-believe. Linda even lied to Charles about having cancer and that she needed more money for treatment. When Charles discovers the lie, he takes drastic action. I warned you. Charles did place an ad in the newspaper at one time stating that he was not responsible for his wife's debts, that he was responsible for no one's debts other than his own. How could you? This is embarrassing. You gave me no choice. That didn't sit too well with her at all. The public put down turns Charles's wife into his enemy. Charles knew Linda was bad news but he wouldn't leave her. That was a fatal. Hammond, Indiana, 1970. Father of five, Charles Darby, comes down with an unknown illness. He couldn't seem to shake the symptoms. Thank you. His wife, Linda, dotes on him until... I'm going to visit my father. He's uh, really ill. She tells him she's going to take the kids to visit her parents. You are, you'll be okay. Leaving Charles to fend for himself. Leaving a spouse who is in the throes of, of a very severe illness like Charles was, was certainly odd behavior. <laughs> Linda is gone for four days. On March 4th, 1970, she returns to Hammond.
but she doesn't go home. She decided to stop and get a motel room, which was curious. With the kids in a motel bed, Linda has an errand to run. Where are you going? She left the other children in the motel room by themselves. She can't tell anybody that. She had told them that if they said anything about her leaving the motel, that she would spank them. She took the youngest, the baby, with her. After leaving the motel, Linda makes a pit stop. She had filled up two five-gallon cans of gas. After that, Linda went to the house that she, the children, and Charles all shared. She left. Charles was asleep. She retrieves a shotgun. And she shoots Charles in the side with that shotgun. And then she puts him inside of a garment bag and zips him up and then pours all that gas on him in the bed. Strikes a match. And keep in mind that Linda has the baby that she and Charles had together with her at the time. Just the fact that she would have that baby with her is diabolical. She doesn't have no conscience. Not at all. Linda flees the scene. When police arrive, they quickly deduce this is no accident. For one thing, uh, it's very obvious that an accelerant was used to start the fire. That's not the only mistake Linda makes. She left a trail of evidence. Linda was identified by the service station attendant. Their tire tracks were covered at the scene that matched the tires on Linda's vehicle. She didn't hide the gun well. The police found it behind the vending machine at the motel. And finally, Charles's body reveals something diabolical. Linda laid the groundwork for this murder months earlier. They said that, you know, he'd been poisoned for months. In October 1970, Linda Darby is convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to life inside the Indiana State Women's Prison. The family was very relieved because uh, they thought, you know, she would pay for the crime she had done for taking his life. But after just two... In 1972, Linda scales a fence at the Indiana State Women's Prison. It wasn't a well-planned escape attempt. It was just spontaneous. She saw the opportunity, and she took it. The escape leaves her with minor cuts. Are you okay? <laughs> Get out here. After she escaped, she met a man named Willie McElroy Jr. <laughs> You're safe here. Willie took pity on her. She uh, she told him that she'd been beaten by her boyfriend. That was what uh, that was what accounted for the cuts and bruises. Willie, being the kind-hearted soul that he was, he took her in, and eventually, a romance blossomed between the two of them. She remarried and had two more children with her husband Willie. For the next 35 years, 
Linda Darby plays the role of Linda McElroy, a law-abiding wife, mother, and even grandmother. Linda opened a little uh, a little junk shop. She cleaned houses. She took care of the elderly, and there was never any inkling that uh, she was, in fact, a convicted murderer living on the run. Linda thinks she can hide forever in this tiny rural town. But there's something she hasn't counted on. The rise of technology. They set up a new computer-based system for tracking escaped fugitives. In 2007, the state of Tennessee begins using new software aimed at smoking out prison escapees. They found on Linda Darby that there were some similarities by her social security number, by her date of birth, and other data that they collect uh, that looked similar to a woman by the name of Linda McElroy who lived in Plasky, Tennessee. All it takes is a knock at the door. Oh, hi, Sheriff. Who are you? And the fugitive murderer, Linda Darby, is at last returned to custody. She's lived on the run for 35 years. They set up this new program, and in 72 hours, she's back behind bars. Same institution where she scaled the fence 35 years earlier. Lynn. She'll die in there. And I don't feel sorry for that. Because she'll pay for it. When she was arrested, the community rallied around her and didn't think she should go to prison because she had been such a good girl for 35 years. Living a crime-free life for 35 years does not make up for murdering an innocent man. Linda had to pay. These deadly women thought they would never have to pay for their crimes. Jean James cut her best friend out of her life. Annie Monahan believed her luck would never run out. And Linda Darby reinvented herself to conceal her heinous history. All three thought they could run and hide forever. Haunting. Catch me if you can. Thank you for watching Investigation. Alamaz, Polaro, Alamaz, Oklahoma, Alamaz, Sophomas, Rogan, Alamaz, Yuri, Alamaz, Yuri, Alamaz, Rogan, Alamaz, Donna E, Alamaz, 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 Oklahoma, Rogan, Oklahoma, Alamaz, Yuri, Alamaz.
Allemaal. Homers. Oklahoma. Homers. Rogan. Homers. Rogan. Homers. 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 Allemaal. Donna. Allemaal. Homers. Allemaal. Allemaal. Homers. Allemaal. Allemaal. Donna E. Donna E. Zokantar <laughs> Rogan? Holmes. Yuri. Rogan. Holmes. Donna E. Donna E. Zokanta. Zokanta. Malamas. Zokanta. Donna E. Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Rogan. Donna E. Oklahoma. Rogan. Donna E. Malamas. Holmes. Malamas. Allemaal. Oh, Lorry. Isa. Isa. Donna E. Isa. Allemaal. 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 Donna E. Allemaal. 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 Homus. 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 Rogan. Lorry.
Oh, klamat. Wat allemaal. Homes. Somers. Somers. Rogan? Oklahoma, Sol Somers. Wat allemaal. Homes. Hilary. Yuri. Hilary. Homes. Oklahoma. Somers. Rogan? Allemaal. Sol Somers. I I I saw. Alamas. I saw. Alamas. Somas. So Somas. Glory. Rogan. Oklahoma. Alamas. Donna. Donna. Alamas. Alamas. I saw. Yuri. So Somas. So Somas. Alamas. Homeless. Alamas. Homeless. Broken. Alamas. Alam Rogan. Homeless. Oklahoma. Alamas. Homeless. Homeless. Yuri. Yuri. So homeless. Rogan. Oklahoma. Alamas. Homeless. Oklahoma. Not Alamas. Homeless. Oklahoma. Yuri. Alamas. Alamas. Alam. Alamas. Homeless. Home. Homeless. Alamas. Homeless. Oklahoma. Oklahoma. So homeless. Donna E. Oklahoma. Homeless. Alamas. Donna, 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 Donna,